Good morning. How many of you have no clue who I am? You have no clue? Okay, thank you. My name is Vincent Como. I am the proud chair of the School of Justice here at Miami-Dade, and I'd like to welcome you here uh, for today's presentation. Um, I'd like to thank Ms. Martha Peterson for taking time out to be with us today, and I would also like to thank you, our audience, students, faculty, and colleagues, uh, for being here to understand the importance of this discussion. The Malls Group, the School of English and Communication, and Ms. Lu Liz Lugo Martinez for putting this all together. Um, we would like you, um, we would also like to welcome our friend from FMU, Broward College, and the FIU. Today we have retired CIA operations officer and author of The Widow Spy, Martha Peterson, who will talk about her career as a CIA operations officer and her story as a spy in Moscow in the 70s and the 80s, being captured by the KGB and subsequently released, breaking through the glass ceiling in the CIA as she was one of the first women ever assigned to Moscow as an operations officer. How exciting can that be? Scary, I think, more than exciting. <laughs> My hope today is that you gain the understanding of the commitment and sacrifices made each day and every day for you, the U.S. citizen. Therefore, please sit back, listen to this true American hero, Ms. Martha Peterson. This is a wonderful thrill for me today. I don't often see uh, young people in my audience because it is a story of, of past history, but it still happens today, and it is a war story, and it's important that we take the past and apply it to the future, as you all understand. Um, I'm very pleased to see so many of you here. Um, I can't imagine uh, as a young uh, college student that, that I would have found this very interesting, but times were very different then. For those of you who are curious, I just need to tell you, I'm 72 years old, um, and I probably look like your grandmother. I am not. And I'm also not James Bond, or Jane Bond, if you were expecting that. Um, I am, though, um, a very proud retiree of the Central Intelligence Agency where I worked for 32 years. That sounds like ages to you because you haven't even been alive that long, many of you. But trust me, life goes very quickly and your experiences pile up. I always told people um, who I was working with that what life is about is taking your experiences, whether they're in the classroom or out in your real life, and filling your pockets with experience. That is how you become the person you want to be and the person who then, 32 years later, can say, I, I, feel, I feel proud of what I accomplished. So my story starts in 1960. Seven, my husband-to-be, he and I graduated from college together. We met the first day of freshman year. And we dated through college, and then after college, although I would have loved to have gotten married at that time, he said, I am going to Vietnam. And, of course, you all know that was um, a difficult and um, tragic war in many ways. So he went to Vietnam. He was a Special Forces Green Beret. He worked up in the Highlands, and he was um, part of an A-team. When he returned from Vietnam, he was alive. And that wasn't the case for a lot of people that came back from Vietnam. 53,000 people died. But he was alive, and he got out of the Army, and he told me... Um, well, actually, after we got married, he told me he was joining the CIA. He couldn't tell me before then because it was a secret. And um, I said, well, wh what does the CIA do? And 
I mean, the only thing I knew that government did was post office and taxes. I was so naive. And he said, well, the CIA collects intelligence about foreign governments. CIA and all the intelligence services gather the information which would help our country in a time of war as well as times of peace. I talked to young 13-year-old uh, kids a while back, and it was right before the Super Bowl, and I said, wouldn't you think the Patriots would love to have the Eagles game plan before they went on the field? And that is what intelligence is. It's having that game plan before you hit the field. So every single play the other team tries, you already know ahead of time. That is the goal of intelligence collection. So John joined the CIA and he became a paramilitary officer. And he went through all the training, the guns and weapons and jumping out of airplanes, as well as how to collect intelligence, how to recruit agents. And we, he then told me our first assignment was to Laos which is later on, if you want to come up and look at the map, you can or look it up later on. Laos is a little country that laid right beside Vietnam, and it played very greatly in the Vietnam War. And our purpose in going to Laos was to collect intelligence about the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, the communist Vietnamese, who were coming from North Vietnam down the Ho Chi Minh Trail to South Vietnam. But his job was more than that. It was to engage the North Vietnamese in war, in fighting on the Ho Chi Minh Trail. He, my husband, recruited and trained young Lao soldiers. He provided them weapons and he provided them uniforms so that they would be able to go out and fight against the North Vietnamese as they came down the Ho Chi Minh Trail. They even built tank traps, which were big holes in the ground, and they put grass and straw over them, and at night the tra tanks, the North Vietnamese tanks, would go over them, of course, and fall into these tank traps. Um, his job was dangerous. He went out in the field with his troops when they were infilling into the, um, into the field, when they were getting ready to go out and fight the North Vietnamese. During one of those operations on October 19, 1972, at age 27, John kissed me goodbye at 4 a.m. He walked out the door and he was killed in a helicopter crash that day. It changed my life forever. You never get over losing someone, but certainly not your soulmate, not the person you'd known for so long and knew so well. I came back to Washington and I had to sign all the, the insurance policies and the death certificates and all that you had to do. And I went to dinner one night with very good friends of mine. They had also served with us in Laos. You know, I will tell you something real that I have discovered in my life. No matter how bad your life becomes or the most difficult situations you find yourself in, you will make the best friends and they will be your best friends forever. And so I went to dinner with those best friends of mine from Laos. And I said, what am I going to do now? And Tom said to me, Marty, you, ha you speak three languages. You have a master's degree. You have life experience that most people will never have. He said, why don't you apply and join the CIA? So I put my application in. And of course, they wanted me, in those days, ladies, they wanted you to be a teacher, a nurse, an admin assistant, certainly not an officer who would go out and try to recruit foreign agents. 
they said, well, you can't go to Latin America because the Latin Mer men won't respect you. Well, you can't go to um, the Near East because, well, they won't even talk to you. And you can't go to Tokyo because uh, they, they are very insecure about uh, foreign women. Um, so everybody laid out all these roadblocks for me. But I said, no, I wanted to be a case officer and I wanted to go into the foreign field to collect this information, that game plan that was going to help the US win the Cold War, which of course was raging. The Cold War was not just between the Soviet Union and the US. The Cold War was also around the world the Soviets were infiltrating their, their way of life and their communist form of government into every continent in the world. So our war was not just in Moscow. Our Cold War was around the world. So I did apply. I was accepted. I was one of very few people in my training class who were female, and we went to the farm, which is the CIA's covert, no longer, you know, we pretend it's covert training program, and there I learned how to look at a group of people, a, f a foreign group of people, and see which people there had the access to information which we would find important and valuable. Um, your target has to fill the need by having access to information. So these foreign intelligence uh, targets had to have a job where they had access to government or other kinds of secrets. Um, sometimes we look at economic or military secrets, that kind of thing. Uh, they're not all government secrets. So. I went through the training at the farm, and I was, I was okay to go, and then I came back to Washington to headquarters, and they said, how would you like to go to Moscow for your first tour? Well, what I knew of Moscow and the Soviet government was not great. I was not a history major and I certainly didn't have the benefits of the information that you're gathering in your classes. But I'm also a person who never turns down a challenge. So that was why I accepted this position in Moscow. So what did I have to do to prepare? I had to take 44 weeks of Russian language. Now, Russian isn't a difficult language if you're good at languages. Uh, and I happen to like languages. It's, it has different, a whole different alphabet. So you just turn your brain off in English and then you learn these new symbols, which is the Cyrillic alphabet. I rather enjoy the 44 weeks of Russian. And at the same time, I was going to Taekwondo classes. Not because I thought I needed it, but because I just thought that was interesting to learn. Later on, people said that was helpful when I was arrested, but I'll tell you about that. So, after I had the 44 weeks of Russian language, they also taught me how to use Minox cameras, small cameras that I could take pictures from my car as I drove through the streets of Moscow taking pictures of covert sites that we could use to communicate with agents. And eventually, I got on that airplane and I flew to Moscow. And in those days, they didn't have any jetways out to the airplane. They just had, they opened the door to the outside and you walked down the, the staircase. Well, when I got to that doorway, and I had flown from southern Florida where my family lived, and they opened that doorway. Let me tell you, it was very cold, and I looked up at the sign over the airport, and it said, Sheremetyevo Airport, and I thought, 
what have I done? <laughs> you, you have to have courage in life, and you have to really believe in, in what you can do. And I guess that was the moment when, when my heart started beating and I knew I was here for a very serious purpose. So I went into the office the next day. The CIA office is located generally in embassies. And that office is called a station. And we have a chief of station and a deputy chief of station. I can't tell you how many there were in that office, but there were probably less than that many. Um, and all of them, of course, were men who had, I had gone through training with. Um, they were all very happy to see me, and I was happy to see them. But that was the only place that I could see them and interact with them. Because, and any of you have watched any spy movies or read spy books, you know we have to operate under cover. We have to operate like we aren't CIA. Well, in this case, um, I was in the embassy, and that's about all I can tell you. If you want to know what my cover position was, which I call my day job, go online. Just Google Martha Peterson spy, and you'll find out what I did during the day. But my night job, my weekend job, was to go out and pick up and deliver packages from our foreign ag from our Soviet agents who lived and worked in Moscow. So what I had to do to prepare to go out and put down and pick up packages was to wear, um, it was to determine whether KGB was following me. And that is not as easy as you think because the KGB even then was very clever. They would follow you from behind, they would follow you driving into you, they would parallel you on the side roads. What we had going for us, though, their, their technology did not allow a lot of beacons to be put on cars and, and different technical approaches. But we had one technical advantage. It was called an SRR100, and it was the size of a thin cigarette pack. It was a metal box. At the top, it had an on-off and a squelch um, knob. And then you plugged in an antenna into the top of it. This antenna was like a, a wire to your cell phone charger. That was about the size of it. And it went from the top of that box, and it was a loop. And you'd wear this loop around your neck. And then you would put that... Um, SR100 box inside your bra or fellows in a pocket. But what we didn't want anyone to know was that we were wearing something like that. The purpose of the SR100 was it had one frequency, one crystal. These were all old time receivers. And it received the communications that the KGB were talking to one another. So if you had two surveillance cars out on the street following one of their targets, one of the CIA officers, you could hear this car talking by radio to that car. It was like magic. We knew where they were and what they were saying. So when the men went out, they would hear on, and they also had a little phonak induction earpiece in their ear. They would hear the targets turning right, the targets turning left, or the targets lost, or he's at home. But they could hear, our officer could hear through this phonak earpiece where, where the surveillance was following them. Now, I had a different problem. Okay, the CIA headquarters had made a harness so that the fellows could wear this harness under their T-shirt so nobody could see the SR-100. And it had a little pocket in it, and they'd put the 
SR100 inside the pocket and the neck loop around and the earpiece in the ear. But you see, I have different equipment, <laughs> if you get my drift. And the harness didn't fit me. So, in 1976, the CIA bought something, a new invention, and sent a piece of it to Moscow, to me. And it was Velcro. We think these things existed forever. It's like plastic bags have always been around. Well, they really haven't. Nora had Velcro. So I took an old t-shirt, I cut it up, and I made a pocket. And I Velcroed it around my bra. So it was in a perfect place. Nobody could see it. Not even my colleagues in, this, in the State Department and the embassy could see it. So I would go out. I would drive my little Soviet-made car around the city to see whether I had surveillance following me. And this is what I heard on my earpiece. Absolutely nothing. Because they weren't interested in me. They didn't see me as a threat. They probably thought I was an admin assistant or secretary, and certainly I was not an officer out collecting intelligence. At the same time, around the world, our officers were recruiting Soviet spies, Soviet citizens working in the Soviet embassies in every embassy in the world. And one of those lived in Bogota, Colombia. He worked for the Soviet embassy there. He worked in the economic section, collecting information on the economy of Latin America and of the Chinese influence there as well. So what we did was we had a telephone tap on the Soviet embassy there. You know, had it been the digital time, it would have been a lot easier, but we were recording remotely these calls through the telephone company there on a reel-to-reel -reel system. You know, for those of you... You know, movies used to come on huge reels, and that's what we were recording these calls into the Soviet embassy. And what were we trying to find? We were trying to find a Soviet official who was what I call coloring outside of the lines. They were people who didn't follow the standards of the typical Soviet official. And the other thing we didn't have was caller ID. That would have been very easy then to say, oh, that's so-and-so or so-and-so. But we had to listen to this over time to get a feel for what that person, who he was, and then eventually identify who he was. Well, this man that we identified was named Alexander Ogorodnik, and we called him by his code name Trigon. And Trigon, we discovered, had several um, girlfriends. Well, he also had his wife there in Moscow, so that was kind of coloring outside the lines, to say so kind of. And he also um, sold a car and was supposed to reimburse the embassy for it, but he kept that money for a while. And he also liked parties, and he also liked different um, amusements there in Bogota than the normal Soviet official. So um, we decided we would try to recruit Trigon to work for the CIA. So we set up a meeting in the Hilton Hotel in the Turkish bath. Now that sounds funny. A Turkish bath is like an indoor pool, but you go in there naked. Um, and it was only for men at the time. So we realized that if we set up the meeting there, one, we could see whether anyone was looking and watching us or whether anyone was listening because you can't hide a microphone under a towel. Uh, so we met this um, Alexander Ogorodnik in the Hilton Hotel Turkish Bath and we proposed to him that he spy for the U.S. government. We already had a good idea from talking to his girlfriend that he would accept this, and he did. We had then to train him on various techniques to use in his embassy job 
so that he wouldn't be seen when he was sneaking documents out to us. If first he used the 35 millimeter camera, he would take documents home, he would take pictures of them, and then give us the film, take the documents back. But eventually, we taught him how to take pictures with a miniature camera concealed in a large black pen about this size. And it was a fountain pen. You all know what a fountain pen is, right? Um, and inside this pen was a camera. So he would lay a piece of paper out on the table, and he would put his elbows on the table, and then he would plunge the camera down, the top of this down, which would take the picture and advance the film. For those of you who know how big two centimeters is, that's how wide the film was. And this film had to be developed. So this is all pre-digital. And they were roll in, in little tiny cassettes that fit in here. So we would give him six or eight of these cassettes. He would put them inside the barrel, each one, take his pictures. Each cassette held 80 pages of documents, and he would take these pictures when he was working in the embassy. These were documents about the Soviet um, activities in Colombia as well as Latin America. We also then, he agreed he would go back and work for us from Moscow and become a real spy in Moscow. And we had to train him how to receive coded radio messages using one-time pads. Those are, are little pads of numbers. And he would have a radio broadcast he could tune into on a radio in Moscow. And there he would um, decipher the messages to him. And he was also given a secret writing carbon. So he could write secret writing messages on the back of innocuous looking letters and mail them to us. So all this training took time. We recruited him in early 1974 and he went back to Moscow in the fall of 74. He had with him a book, a big, big fat book, and inside were hidden the elements of what he needed when he first got back to Moscow. But his first job when he returned to Moscow was to find a good job with access to information that he knew that would be useful to the U.S. government in our game plan during the Cold War. Now... He also asked for something else before he went back to Moscow, and that was a way to commit suicide in the event that he was caught and faced torture by the KGB. So we agreed to that, and we told him when he got back to Moscow, we would deliver a third pen, the one, second pen being the camera, the third pen, would be a pen which had an L pill in it. An L pill means a lethal pill with some kind of poison. So that third pen had the ink in it, but at the very tip of that pen, at the, ten at the end of the ink capsule, was a little tiny capsule with poison in it. And we instructed him, if at the point you think they are onto you, you have been captured, if you bite down on the pen, you will die. <clears throat> People ask me, was that normal? No, it wasn't normal. I was shocked out of my mind. I couldn't believe that we gave poison to agents. But in the event he was caught and, and faced torture, that would have been like having guns bullets in your gun, and it's, it was uh, perhaps um, a moral issue um, that we gave him that capability. We didn't deliver that to him until he got back to Moscow. So he returned to Moscow in the fall of 74. He did exactly what we told him to do. He didn't contact us, and he didn't um, do anything that would cause any suspicion. 
He got his car off of blocks. Um, he kept it on blocks because they didn't have winter weight oil in Moscow, so nobody drove their personal cars during that time. He also had to get his apartment back, and he had to get the job, the one that would give us the most bang for the buck. He was paid very well for his services, I have to tell you, and we put his money into an escrow, into a savings account with CIA, so that eventually when he was had a new assignment overseas, he could leave Moscow again and we would give him all that money. So he left, he went back to Moscow, he did all that. In the meantime, I arrived in November of 75. Uh, it was cold, like I said, and I settled in. I was feeling very good about learning my way around the streets of Moscow. Over on this side here, for those of you who are interested afterwards, I have a, a map of Moscow. It is a CIA-produced map, and it has the old names of Moscow, um, certainly not the new revised friendly Putin names. <laughs> so... Um, in December, we got a mark on a building, a signal from Trigon that he was ready to start communicating with us. It was almost like I was destined to be there at this time. Our deputy chief of station, Jack Downing, who is a Marine, w ran every single day in Moscow, runs still today, and his job was to pick up the first drop that Trigon, by putting his signal up, said he would put down. So Jack went out and wrote, ran up the Nabarezhnaya, which is a sidewalk along the river. He went about three miles, he turned, and he came back towards his apartment. And on the way, there was a portico over the sidewalk. And this is where we agreed Trigon would put his first package. And as he went through the portico, Jack reached down and picked up the package and tucked it inside of his jogging suit. He went back to his apartment and, and got ready for work to come into the embassy. Jack had surveillance 24 hours a day. Anytime he left that embassy, he had surveillance. Whether he went to church, took his kids to school, went to work, went out for a jog, he always had surveillance. But this morning, as in all mornings, Jack did this at 5.30 every morning, and it was very cold in Moscow. So those surveillance were sitting in the car, and they said, yep, there he goes, and he could hear this in his ear. Yep, there he goes, he's going down the river, he, oh, he's turning around like he always does, and he's coming back, and he got home, and the surveillance never left the warmth of their car. He had trained them well. So Jack brought in the package. It was a pyramid-shaped milk carton, kind of crushed and nasty. But inside, uh, we found two pieces of paper with children's drawings on them. Our tech took them into the back room and took this special developer and wiped that paper, and up came Trigon's message to us. It was thrilling. He said, I am so happy to be in touch with you. I have divorced my wife. I don't want her involved in this. And I have the perfect job. I work in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, which is... Uh, the State Department's equivalent. So our State Department is their Foreign Affairs Department. So he had a job in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in the Global Activities Department. He said he had one coworker, and he told us he had access to every document that the ambassadors, the Soviet ambassadors overseas wrote back to the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So when the Soviet minister, uh, Soviet ambassador in Tokyo or in Bogota or in London or in Mexico City or in Brasilia, when 
he would write or she would write a, a report back to say how they were doing in that country, he would get the report. So we had a window on the whole world about what the Soviets were doing in that country and what they planned, because that is the intelligence value of having um, spies, is knowing the plans and intentions of the foreign government. The other thing he had was the reports back from Ambassador Dubrinin, who was the Soviet ambassador to the US in Washington, DC. So the ambassador in Washington, DC would go meet Henry Kissinger or our president or the State Department chief or the Department of Defense and they would have a meeting, and then Dubrinin would come back and write out this report about what the Americans said and what the Soviet Union should do and what their negotiating plans were. So in fact, we had a total picture of what the Soviet government was planning on doing in the US through these reports that Trigon t could take pictures of. So he wanted that camera back. So we did an immediate drop to him um, to supply the camera. Now, my job in Moscow was to deliver and pick up packages from these secret agents, and in particular, from Trigon. So how did I do that? Well, first, we had to package his secret equipment in a concealment device. And if you just wait a minute. Now, CIA wouldn't let me bring the real thing. Oh, well. So this is from our backyard, but you'll get the idea. This was and is a log. And it's from our backyard in North Carolina. However, the log we gave him was made of uh, uh, polyurethane or some other kind of thing, and it was formed with a pocket in the middle. So you could take the top off, if you knew how to open it, and inside then were concealed all of the equipment that he needed. We gave him the pen, we gave him cassettes, Remember, I said 80 pages on each cassette, and we'd give him six or eight cassettes. That a lot, a lot, a lot of pages of documents. We also gave him um, secret writing, uh, one-time pads. We gave him all of the directions to different sites around town where he could put down a package, and we would pick it up. Because I had no surveillance, nobody was following me, I could go out, leave the embassy at 6 p.m. after I did my day job. I would go home and I would change into very drab looking clothes. I never wore disguises. I just wore a, a hat that looked kind of like a Soviet hat. I had these felt boots that looked like a Soviet woman. And it was cold, it was winter, and I would drive away from my apartment, headed towards the embassy in case someone was following me. But when I determined that no one was following me, I could diverge from that route. And then I drove all over Moscow, trying to make sure I had no surveillance. I was wearing the little earpiece listening, and I was using all my senses to determine I had no surveillance. I'd park my car and then get out of the car and get into the subway. And I had this in, in actually tucked inside my pants waistline under my coat. It was too big to fit into a purse and I always worried about someone grabbing my purse. I would drive like I say, for two and a half to three hours, I would get into the subway, I'd 
changed three or four times. And when I got to the subway stop where I needed to be, I would get off, and then I'd walk a mile or two down the road into a park, which was called Park Pabieti. It was a war memorial park. Nobody ever went there. It had one road that came through the middle of the park, and on either side of the road was a pathway under the trees. So if you walked on that pathway, the person driving on the road, if there ever was one, really couldn't see walking on that path. I would get to the site by walking down that path, then I would walk out to a lamp pole, and it was a numbered lamp pole that's, that Trigon knew that was where the package would be. I would drop this beside my leg and just let it fall on the ground, and then I would leave the area for an hour. After an hour, I would come back, and during that hour, Trigon had come to that site, he had picked up my package, and he had left his package. He put his, his film from this camera, those little cassettes, he put that film into a condom because that would keep it dry and clean, and he wanted to make sure we got all of these cassettes without damaging them. So he would put them all into a condom, tie the top real tight, and then stuff it into an old dirty mitten or a rusty tin can, uh, sometimes one of those milk cartons, and he would leave it in the same place he had found my package. And that would be my confirmation that he had, uh, he had received the package. This was... Uh, a, a long night, a long, dark, cold night in Moscow. People walked on the streets. Women were out um, walking because the apartments were small, and often two or three families lived together in an apartment. So people would go out and walk in the night um, to give the other people privacy or be able to have time with their family. So I did this about 12 times in Moscow. This worked exceedingly well. He gave us a lot of information through this miniature camera. Um, and come April of 1977, we got a package from him. And our tech, when he opened this package, said something's different about this package. So we sent the miniature cassettes back to headquarters to have them develop this little film. And they said, there is something different about the information in this package. It's still good. It's still verified by other forms of intelligence. But there was just some anomaly that was different. So that didn't mean we were going to quit providing Trigon with packages and all this, and he wasn't going to, we hoped, quit giving us information. But it was a little problem area that we felt we had, and we didn't know whether maybe he was sick. So our next delivery to Trigon was the 21st of, or 24th of June. It was the last scheduled delivery we had. So it was very important that he get this package. So I went out that night, and Moscow in the summer is very light outside. It's almost daylight, even at midnight. It never gets dark. It's a very strange feeling. You can be out you're coming home from the Marine House and having a few beers, and it's daylight, and nobody's out on the street. It's very strange. So that um, package we had for him on the 24th was also a log like this. But when I left my apartment that night in my car and drove oh, away from my apartment, it started to rain, and it rained and rained, and nobody carries umbrellas. So by the time then I got out of the car into the metro and then out onto the street again. I, was, I looked like a drowned rat. 
And it really was unusual for people to stay out in the rain, but I had no choice. So I took the log, I walked down into the woods, I put the log down, and I walked away. And I spent an hour walking through other neighborhoods, standing in doorways out of the rain, but eventually the rain stopped, and I returned then to the same park. And as I came down into that park on the path under the trees, there was a white van parked in the street, and I had never seen any cars ever parked there. Yes, it made me very worried. The light in the dome light in the cab of this van was on, and the windows were frosted over. So I thought, well, it's either an ambush or it's Lover's Lane, and they're sitting inside the van. So I continued to walk down the path so that I would not go to where his package was waiting for me, I hoped, but I would walk down the path and wait a little bit, then come back and see whether the van had left. So I came down a little rise in the path, and I'm under the trees, and as I came to where another tr path intersected what the one I was on, a man stepped in front of me. He was big. He had a raincoat on. He had a military cap with like a shower cap over the top to keep the top dry, and he had a big flashlight. He looked at me. I looked at him. We were both startled to meet anyone in the woods. I just continued walking with purpose, and I assume he left. I went down, and I stood off the side of the path because I thought if he comes back, and he looks down, I didn't want him to see my silhouette. I stayed under that bush tree off the path for 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and then I decided I would cross the street and walk back up the other side of the street under that those trees on that path to see whether the van had left. And when I came back, the van was gone. And I looked across and there was no one around. So I cut diagonally across the street and looked down at the lamp pole, and there was my package. Trigon hadn't been there that night. So I was very worried. I left, I went back through the metro, got into the subway, and then to my car and drove home. And the next morning I went in and I said, Trigon wasn't there, Ugh, but I ran into this man. So we, we worried about Trigon. We wondered what had happened to him, what had, perhaps what awful thing possibly could have happened to him to miss this meeting. So we put a message up on the radio broadcast saying, friend, if you can uh, make a mark on a children crossing sign, and he knew where it was because it was a code name Dechi, which means children. And he had a sketch of it that we had made for him. Make your mark so we can read it on the morning, a Friday morning of July 15th. So the next morning I got up on July 15th and drove to, towards the site where the children's sign was on the pole. It was way beyond the booth in the back here. It was a long ways back, and I could see a red mark on that pole. It looked like it had been stenciled on. So I didn't look up at the pole. I just kept driving by. I got into the embassy, and I told my friends in the station the signal was up, Trigon's ready for his package. So we had the package all prepared that night. I had to do my day job during the day. That night, I went up to the station after I worked, and I got the drop for that night for Trigon. 
It was a piece of concrete, a little bit thicker than this, but it had four screws on each corner, and they were, you know, you, you turn a screw right to tight and left to loose. Well, these were the opposite, so if someone found them, maybe they'd be confused. So this was a drop that I was to put down that night for Trigon. I took it home with me in my purse, and I put it um, in another purse that I carried on the street. And I had no, con no hiding places in purses. They were just regular purses. And I then changed my clothes like I told you I did and looked kind of normal, drab, Soviet woman. And I went out, got in my car, drove the two and a half hours. Now I had eyes all over my head looking for surveillance because now I was very worried that this signal site had been put up by the KGB and we were all very worried that this might be an ambush. I drove for two hours, two and a half hours. I thought about all the things I'd done in Moscow. And I thought, well, if I get caught tonight, at least I've done all the things I wanted to do. <laughs> so I got um, to the place to park my car. I got out of the car. I took my purse. I went into the subway. I rode the several stops, changed several times, and ended up at Lenin Stadium and a soccer game was letting out. So all the people were trying to get into the trains as I was trying to get out. And I noticed nobody else was getting off the train at that time. I went out on the street and I walked through this very dark park. I stopped several times. I listened on my SR100. I saw nothing, I heard nothing. So I went up to the Nabarezhnaya where the railroad bridge across the Moscow River was located. The drop site was in one of these pillars on the bridge. But I was a little early, so I turned and I walked away and I walked up the river and I got, um, oh, maybe 10 minutes away, I turned around and I started walking back towards the railroad bridge. When I did, I saw three men across the street. They had bright white dress shirts on and they were walking um, towards me, but it was like eight lanes across. It was a long ways. And as they got to Novodevichy Cemetery, they turned into the cemetery. Kind of strange to go to a cemetery at night, but like I said, it was very still very daylight. And this is where Khrushchev was buried, a former president, as well as the Soviet cosmonauts who had died in an accident, as well as composers and artists. So these three men walked into the cemetery, and I thought, well, they probably aren't a threat to me. Then I went to the bridge, and I climbed the stairs to the top of this railroad bridge. There, it was a pedestrian walkway that went across beside the tracks through the pillars. I got to the top, and a train came from behind me. He had his headlights on, and he shone the headlights across the whole bridge so I could see whether anyone was there and nobody was there. I went into the pillar. I took the package out of my purse, and I put it in a small window inside the pillar. It was a deep window. So I put it in there, and Trigon and I had used this site before, so he knew his package would be arm's length into that narrow window. I walked out on the bridge. I listened. I looked around. I saw no one. I came down back through the pillar and down the stairs. And it was about the fourth stair from the bottom. And here came those three men towards me. The guy in the middle said, flank her, don't let her run. They were speaking in Russian, but I understood a lot of Russian then. The middle guy came towards me. The two fellows grabbed me by my arms. Now, I don't know, I don't know about you, but I haven't been grabbed like that since I was probably four or five years old. So I was 
instantly angry. And I started to say, you have to let go of me. And then I realized he was going to take my purse from me. So as all women do to protect our purses, what do we do? We go like this, right? And what I did was drive this man's hand right into the SR-100 on the side of my body. Well, they thought I had a weapon. They thought I had something. And so if you look at the picture on the back of the book or the picture in the spy museum, it is of me with an ugly look on my face with all these hands inside my blouse trying to get this thing off of my bra. But you see, they hadn't invented Velcro in Moscow. They had no clue how difficult it is unless you rip it apart. They were just trying to pull it off. It was quite a tug of war. Now, I will tell you that I was angry because I realized something had happened to Trigon. So I was yelling, you need to let go of me. I'm an American diplomat. You may not hold me. Let go of me. And my mother probably wouldn't have been very happy either with me because I, in my anger, I was kicking people. Now, there's a video of me done on the History Channel, and they interview one of the Soviet KGB officers who was at the site that night, and he says, oh, she fought like a tiger. She kicked everyone. She, I met a friend later on who was there. She even hospitalized him, and he couldn't have sex for six months. <laughs> okay, so you get the picture. I was, I was so angry, and truly, I don't remember being that violent. But it, you know, you, you respond in different situations differently, and I would have never said I would have lost my cool like that, but I was very angry. So they had, of course, eventually got the SR-100 off. They then had the package immediately and they were holding it up beside me to take a picture. Uh, a van from under the, tra uh, the, the train tracks came around, and it was like a circus van with all these people getting out. It was clear they were surprised it was a woman. They didn't know my name until they looked in my purse and took my diplomatic card out that said Martha Peterson. So after a lot of tense moments there, they put me into the van, and they took me to Lubyanka Prison. Lubyanka Prison is where um, evil president of the Soviet Union would take um, mostly dissidents and Jews into Lubyanka, and they would never be seen again. So here I was headed for Lubyanka Prison. But I had one thing going for me. I was an, a, a diplomat in the Soviet Union, an American US government diplomat, and they could not keep me or harm me. So they took me into a, a conference room where there were two microphones. They laid the package out on a piece of newspaper the newspaper was Pravda, which was their newspaper at the time, a state-controlled newspaper, and Pravda means truth. And they put the package there and took the lid off and started taking all the items out of it. When the interrogator got to the black pen, which I knew in this package was a camera, he said, lay that down, nobody touch it. And instantly I knew he thought it was poison. He obviously had some knowledge that Trigon had poison. So they called someone from the American embassy who came down and represented me. And then eventually, 2 o'clock in the morning, I was arrested Friday night at 10.30. At 2 o'clock in the morning, they said, you may leave which I was very shocked. It didn't last all night, but it wasn't an interrogation. This man did not want everyone in the room to know um, 
about Trigon. So I went back to the embassy. I told them all in the station what had happened. The chief said, what do you want to do? And I said, go home. I was done. I went home the next day, which was Saturday. I got home on Sunday. At the airport as I arrived was my friend Jack Downing, who had picked up the first drop, and his wife, and two security officers. And then there were two other officers waiting there, men in suits. And as I arrived into the out, came through customs and all, and said hello, these two men walked away. Well, if they'd been waiting for someone, wouldn't you think they would have waited? But of course, they were waiting for me. They were KGB officers who were sent to the airport to make sure that I got home safely. We'll leave it at that. So I went to see the director of Central Intelligence, Stansfield Turner. He was a Navy admiral. Um, he liked, he really preferred satellites over human, over collection from human sources. Uh, but um, he was very curious about the case and about what, I, what had happened to me. So he, he talked to me, and then he said, would you be willing to go see um, to the White House tomorrow? So on um, Tuesday morning, I went to the White House, to the Oval Office, where I briefed Jimmy Carter, Walter Mondale, and Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was the head of the National Security Council. He was the only one, I think, in the room who knew the value of what Trigon had been giving to us through these drops and what we were losing by not having Trigon. Now, at this moment, we have no idea uh, where or what happened to Trigon. So it was quite a while before we got word that they had, in fact, found Trigon through the transcriber of the telephone taps back in Bogota. That's how long it took them to uncover Trigon and what he was doing. This transcriber had been hired by CIA as a contractor to transcribe these reel-to-reel -reel tapes. Why? Because he was from Czechoslovakia, he had volunteered to the Czech service at the time. The Czech service told the KGB they had a source who worked in CIA. And he told them that he was transcribing texts or tapes from Bogota. And that is how they found Trigon. So they had to wait and they put cameras in Trigon's apartment and eventually they caught him going into his bookcase and taking down a couple of small concealments that we had given him. And they watched as he read these secret notes to him. They watched him on the camera. They came through the door. And they said, you're under arrest. We know what you've been doing. They stripped him down to make sure he had nothing dangerous on him. And he said, I will help you out. I'll give you a complete confession of what I have done. He said, give me a pad of paper and my pen. And he took the pen. He started writing. And he bit down on the capsule of poison and died later that night. The, I think they were all so angry they didn't have a chance to debrief him. They didn't have a full case that they could prosecute. They didn't have enough evidence. He hadn't confessed. He had died. And so um, it was a very difficult moment for the KGB and for the Soviet government. And in fact, he was never tried, even in death. He was never tried. He was given... The, his family was allowed to bury him, and it never appeared in the newspapers what his name was or what he was doing. So um, that is the story of Trigon. I have to tell you that it was 
not until 19, I, I was arrested in 1977, and they did not arrest that transcriber until 1984. So in those intervening years, I lived with the fact that maybe it was me who had made a mistake out on the streets that had, in fact, led them to Trigon. Maybe putting down a drop, I had had surveillance. And this is what went through my mind all the time. We are professionals, but we're people, we're human beings, and we truly, um, in every case I have ever been involved with, our agents are the most important thing, not us. Our agent security is the most important thing. And I must say, living those years worrying about what might have happened to him. And eventually then we did discover what happened to him. Now, it's interesting. I told you he had a girlfriend in Bogota, Colombia. Her name was Pilar, and she actually was a Spanish citizen from Madrid. And she worked in Bogota for Nestle Chocolate. And she was there, and then she'd go home, visit her friends, and she and Trigon did have this affair. And she was pregnant when he decided he would go back to Moscow and work for us. She pro made us promise we would not tell him that she was pregnant. And during the time he was in Moscow, we passed letters from him to her and her to him through these dread drops. So it was a, a wonderful thing that we could keep, you know, this connection with her. But she never admitted to him that she had a, a, a baby girl in Madrid in March of 1977. And after I wrote this book, and those of you who have read it know, um, the worst day of my life, I told my husband, was going to be the day when that young woman found me through my book and stood on our doorstep. This was going to be the worst day because what would I say to this young woman whose father had died serving CIA, being one of our world, the best agents that we had ever had? Well, it happened. She didn't stand on the doorstep, but she did email me. And it said, in the subject, it said, I am Alejandra Orognikova, Trigon's daughter. Well, you can imagine how human that made me feel that this young woman was reaching out to me to find her father. She knew he was dead, <coughs> pardon me, but she wanted to rebuild her father and, and put together this man who had spied against his country. So, and Christmas last year, we went to Washington, D.C., and she flew from Spain, and we met her. And she brought along her two children, who were 17 and 14. And my husband and I walked into the hotel in Washington, D.C., and it was like we had seen a ghost, because that grandson, Trigon's grandson, looked just like him. And, you know, that makes these war stories so personal, so real. These are real agents collecting a fabulous treasure trove of intelligence for us, but they are real people. So that is my story. I'm not going to tell you any more, but I'd love to answer any questions you have, and I'll answer them if I can. The CIA read my book four times to make sure I told no secrets. So all of this has been approved. But you can ask me any kind of question. Or if you want to come up afterwards and chat, I'll be willing to do that. So <coughs> thank you. Yes, 
I, yes. So I came back and <clears throat> I had a kind of quiet year and then the following year, my name, my picture, all of it was on the front page of the Washington Post. So you think, well, her cover's blown, right? But it was when ladies changed their names when they got married. So I married a man who I'd met in Moscow. He worked in our embassy and Steve and I got married and I changed my name so I had a natural alias. So, um, so in the mid 90s, um, he had to stay at home. He worked for the State Department. Uh, and I went to overseas, to Europe, uh, with my two children that I had had then. And we had quite an interesting experience. But my children did not know who I worked for. Um, the uh, fact that I didn't tell them was because young children would not value a secret. They'd go to school and tell everybody, my mom works for CIA. <laughs> so I waited till we got back from being overseas and then I, my son was addicted to the Discovery Channel and I knew there was a story coming out about me with my picture and I knew he'd find it and say, what's this mom? <clears throat> so. I went and actually took them to CIA. I bought them a T-shirt, you know. It was kind of the whole thing. But until then, they didn't realize who, what their mom did. And probably you don't know what your parents do. I'll put that in your mind. Think about it. They get, they get up, they dress, they go to work, right? And they come home, and what have they been doing? So and I just like to put that in your mind. <laughs> so, yes. Yes. Did my, were my children angry with me because I hadn't told them? Well, I think momentarily they were angry, but then they were kind of, what does that mean and what have you been doing? So slowly I peeled the story back so that they could know it. But yes, and that's a problem. If you wait too long to tell children the truth, then they wonder if you're ever going to tell them the truth about anything. So yes, that's a danger. And those of us who worked undercover always had that discussion with each other. When is the best time to tell your children? So that was a good, good question. And that's how I start the book, is how I told my children what I did. <clears throat> my children had a hard time um, reading the book. It's very personal. And you know, you don't read a book that your mother wrote about her weird life, so it, it was difficult for them. Any other questions? Yes. Yes. Um, my name is Ildiko. I teach um, reading and writing here. And I'm, I first want to say thank you for coming. Thank yeah. you for writing your compelling yes. story. Thank, thank you. you, Liz, for organizing this. And um, I want to say, coming from the Eastern Bloc and being Alejandra's age, um, I recognize a lot of the scenes, a lot of the, mm -hmm. <laughs> the things you're talking about. Um, and I'd like to know if there is a part two. No. The, <laughs> are, um, are you allowed to share what happens after you come back, some of the other compelling stories that you may have had? That's what my husband keeps asking me. <laughs> but I also tell him that a lot of my career, like what your careers will be, some is really exciting and other parts is just kind of normal life and work. So I'm not sure that I would ever write anything. I would have to have it cleared by the CIA. And although many of the things I did were very exciting, I think the reason I wrote this was, was not as personal as you think. It, it was to make sure that these two men, Trigon, as well as my husband, John Peterson, had their story in the world, because otherwise you would never know about these two people. And they really are heroes to me who, who gave us a lot. So that was more of my um, motive. But I also have to tell you, I am not a writer, and writing this book was a real challenge, because I didn't know how to go about it. I figured a, 
You write about yourself, you start from day one, you were born. Well, no, who wants to know about that? We all have that in common, right? You really need to write the, the things that are unique. And so if in your life you decide to keep a journal, remember, it's the people and the experiences, the places you go, those are the significant moments in your life. Everybody else does all the other stuff, but you have to focus in on those very wonderful and exciting and sad moments. Question. Yes. Ms. Peterson, thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. For not only being here, but of course your sacrifice to the nation. Uh, I appreciate very much uh, your work on behalf of the United States. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm getting a cold. <laughs> oh dear, <clears throat> stay back there. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if you're ever disheartened by the fact that a lot of folks don't understand the <clears throat> danger that that uh, hideous ideology poses to not only the United States, but freedom uh, around the world and, and how <clears throat> it really poses a great threat to democracy and, <clears throat> and to uh, our way of life. Uh, to freedoms to people all over the world. I wonder if you could address, does that dishearten you, the fact that folks don't understand <clears throat> the dangers of communism and socialism and these kinds of ideologies that espouse lesser freedoms and <clears throat> um, values that are um, undemocratic and everything? Yes. I would love to. Um, living in Moscow was a life experience um, that I hope you all never have, to see the fact that children are raised to read um, one newspaper, one book, one thought, no churches, no um, ability to even ask a question of their professors or of, of each other that one will report on the other. You have no concept unless you have lived in this type of society where freedom is, it, it doesn't exist. And it's, it's easy to say, well, you know, you know it, we'd just kick them out or something. No, it becomes this way of life. Look at North Korea. They're clapping in sequence. You know, there that is something that you really have to think about. And that is a system they're living under. The fact that I, living in Moscow as a diplomat, had to go to a diplomatic store to buy food because the other food was so awful. Now, it wasn't awful spoiled. To get meat in fat, some kind of protein in winter, I would go to the winter the market, which was down the street from me, and the Soviet citizens would take the skull of a, a cow, and they would be digging the flesh out of the skull to use as fat, zhir, in their soups, because there wasn't anything else to buy. I mean, canned anything was very hard to find. Black bread, you could eat black bread. Or a cabbage, they would soak cabbage in salt water to preserve it. Well, I bought one once, and it took weeks to get the smell out of my apartment because it was rotten cabbage. It was just awful. I'm talking basics of life. Going to a hospital, which I had to do in my day job, and <clears throat> seeing the emergency room with no equipment in it, no oxygen, no nothing. They, they, did, they don't value each person, each individual, because freedom starts with each person. You have your own freedom. And then that builds out into a society of people who value freedom. And, <clears throat> yeah, I think if you just... You know, listen and read what, what is happening in North Korea. It is a classic, classic example of a country without freedom. And I'm telling you, that changed my uh, outlook and value of my life and all that, the, not the riches we have, but the, the essence of, of um, uh, 
valuing each other and being part of a free society is, it's priceless, priceless. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, one more question. Um, Peters. One more question. Um, to, to all your experience in your life, there is one thing that changed you like from who you are now? Change the way you think, the way you think and everything. There's one experience that changed you of who you are now? I think if I can be very personal, one thing is the death of my first husband, it made me a different person. I, I realized that you assume nothing in life. Every day is, is a gift and it is, uh, that was the moment. And I have to tell you, my daughter, who was 34, she passed away two years ago. And that is equally the most important thing that has formed has transformed me. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Peterson, thank yes. you so much. Uh, Hector Cadavid from FIU's Intelligence Fellowship Program. I echo the previous sentiments. Thank you for your service to our country and, and for sharing this amazing, amazing story. Um, I would like to ask you, what, what advice would you have for you know, the youth in this audience, um, and particularly students who are aspiring to one day enter the intelligence community and, and maybe one day be aspiring intelligence officers and who may think, you know, maybe the di director of operations is something for me, right? That's a brave new world where yes. women are, in essence, in the front lines and play an incredible, valuable uh, service to, our, to the defense and, and, and safeguarding of our country. Um, so again, you mentioned you were a pioneer, in a sense, back in those days to, to be out there in the, in the field um, in, in the DO, if you will, in operations, what, what advice would you have for young men, but particularly young women, uh, who, who may think, well, this is not for me, or this may not be a role that I could actually, uh, you know, participate or, mm -hmm. or thrive in? I never thought I was different from my male counterparts. I always had self-confidence in what I was out to do and the goals I had set. And I think that is the most important thing, that you have the self-confidence. Then, that you have that, those pockets full of experience that you bring to the table, each one of you different than the other. And it's, um, it's having that confidence and the experiences and paying attention to all the details. Don't let things slip by without you're really taking a look at it. Intelligence collection is very interesting. You do it all the time. You, you gossip or you find out information about different people. These are not skills we don't all have innately as human beings because we live in a community. But I think you need to pay attention to the kind of person you want to be and set your goal for that. Don't let yourself be derailed by people who would want you not to succeed or by your own doubts. You have to have confidence and you have to kind of take the steps that will get you where you want to be. But I also believe in, you know, love of your fellow student and making sure that you are a honest and forthright person. I think those are very important things. I must say, when, when I went to join CIA and they said I had to take a polygraph, I thought, oh, whoa, wait a minute, this is a little different spin. Um, but you know what? I had never done drugs. I had never stolen anything. And I, I could tell the man, I'm good, you know? He wanted to pin something else on me, but we won't go on to that particular road. I think he had a grudge. I, I think he didn't, I think he was an odd polygrapher. But you, you have to live your life true to yourself and true to your family and true to who you want to be. And I think that gets you there. And a follow-up question, if I may. Um, if you could, you, one particular episode you just mentioned in your story and in your, over the course of your career, and it's something that is said at the agency, speaking truth to power. C can you share a little bit more about that and sense of your career, and in particular that moment when you had to debrief the president 
and you're there in the Oval Office, and, and again, you're speaking truth to power, which is, in essence, the role of, of the agency. Well, it, it is, because we are an independent uh, source of information. We aren't uh, thrown, well, we're not supposed to be thrown back and forth by the political realities of the day. Um, uh, and I think in the past, the CIA has been sucked into some of that. Um, but we have to take the facts and present them to the president. That is our role. We don't put any political spin on it. We take all source information and try to provide the best and most honest and forthright uh, material to the president so he can make the decisions. That's where the intelligence community does so well. We take that information, we package it up, but we don't tell policymakers how to use that information, and that is over to them. And I must say, speaking to President Carter that day, he didn't really understand um, what it was that we had lost, but I, I think I was, well, you know, you can see who I am. I'm not one to mince words, and I, I told him very directly this was, you know, a, a devastating blow to the intelligence collection on the Soviet Union. And of course he accepted that, but that's the other thing. Integrity is the name of the game when you come to the intelligence community. Thank you, Marty. Yes, for sure. <clears throat> um, Mrs. Peterson will have books for sale and she will also be autographing them. If you're interested, you're welcome to stay a little bit longer. Are there any additional questions? Yes, just a quick housekeeping item. Please complete your evaluations. We'll be taking them as you exit. And also, don't forget the US State Department will be here on campus and you've got the flyer on your seat. Um, I have this question, it's kind of like a funny one. Would you go back into service? No, I wouldn't. No, the young people need to take on this mantle now. It's a more dangerous world. Um, the terrorist target is not a, a country. And it is, I think, the most dangerous world now. And that's why we need intelligence even more. Yeah. Thank you for being here. Thank really you. It. it was great. Thank you. It was great meeting you all. Thank you. Good luck. Yes.